uh, we really want to jump into this about, uh, you know, the whole Murder Dolls uh, 21 year anniversary celebration. Uh, what inspired you to go out and to do this tour? Uh, unfortunately, it was the passing of Joey. Um, and, you know, Joey passed away uh, in 2021. And uh, last year, <clears throat> I uh, was touring as, uh, in the States and I was doing this. Uh, 20 years of fear tour. And I was just kind of focusing on different aspects of my career of the 20 years. And, uh, there was a part in the show where we did a, a murder dolls section and, and, uh, the crowd, you know, loved it. And, uh, and just hearing people talk about it after the show on the social media and stuff and people talking about how, how good it was to hear those songs because no one really got to see murder dolls play live. Um, in the States, it, it seemed that uh, we only, we did very few tours, uh, on both albums. So, um, so yes, yeah, for people to hear those songs live, it, it was really cool. So it just, you know, got the idea of, you know, well, I could go out and just do a murder dolls only set, uh, you know, and do tribute to, you know, 21 years of the band and, and Joey and Ben and, uh, you know, do it for the fans and, and, you know, the reaction so far, uh, with these tour announcements have been, uh, have been great. Yeah, they really have been too. And I know that I'm definitely excited to catch the, the show myself. Um, but going back to the beginnings of murder dolls, how did you first get acquainted with Joey Jordison? Uh, you know, it was, <clears throat> different time back then you know most people do text messaging and and uh, uh social media you know these days or with you know facebook messages and instagram messages but sure. but then it was just uh you know getting to know people and and passing your phone number along not even an, an email uh so uh i had become friends with uh with trip eisen uh, when he was in the band dope Yep. Uh, and that's also where where I had met uh, met AC at the yep. at the same time, uh, and uh, he told me that he was uh, doing a project with Joey Jordis and a Slipknot, and uh, I didn't know who he was in the band. The band was still relatively new. It just wasn't on my radar. I knew who they were; they were huge, but I just wasn't you know my type of music I listened to. So I'm like, but I knew they were huge. Uh, and he was like, you know, I'm working on this project and, uh, you know, we could, uh, we, we, we need someone to, uh, to play bass for this, for this thing. And, uh, and that's how my name sort of got in the hat. And then, uh, I guess it got back to Joey and the front guy they had at the time, Dizzy, uh, he contacted me, we hit it off. Great. They were a big, they were a big fan of my band, Frankenstein drag Queens. Yeah. And, and Joey wanted to incorporate those songs in to what was the rejects, which was what that project was at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at first it was a handful of songs like twist my sister. Um, I can't remember what the other ones we did. Um, but there was a handful of, of songs like, like four and we went up and we recorded and did like, uh, uh, I guess what we called the demos, which ended up being on the record anyway, uh, beyond the Valley. But, uh, we did these versions of the songs where I played bass and did background vocals and Dizzy did, did vocals over it. And, uh, then Joey went on tour with Slipknot and we just kind of waited until he had time to work on this. So, so it was really just a waiting game. So this is going on through 2000, 2000, 2001. Uh, and when Joey came back from tour, he was like, well, um, you know, I've been listening to your music more. I think I want to add this song to Dawn of the Dead and I want to add this song and I want to add this song. And, uh, and then it just became more of my stuff. And I was just kind of like, and of course I was, you know, I was eager to do whatever I was, you know, I was determined to, to escape North Carolina and get out of my, my dead end job and, and get my foot in the door of this, this this world and i was going to do it no matter what and but as we st joey started picking more songs he was leaning more toward my voice because dizzy couldn't do what what i did with those songs right. and then it just became hey um i think i want you to be the vocalist and we're going to call it something totally different and then that's when it just morphed into murder dolls and uh 
so yeah, that's kind of how it happened. And it literally, you know, it wasn't these big thought out plans and this master manager behind us going, all right, we're going to do this. And it's a big year. I mean, we literally just flew at the seat of our pants. It was like, you know, Joey had two months off from Slipknot and it was go make it up as you go. What are we going to look like? I don't know. What are we going to wear uh, this, uh, you know? So, uh, but luckily we, we had this look within our sales, our own personalities. Uh, when we all got together, we all ironically had red and black hair. Uh, you know, we just looked like a band, you know, before, before we were, you know? Uh, and, uh, so when it came time to assemble the live group, we just, we picked Eric and, and Ben, um, just basically off, we thought they looked cool. And then we're like, all right, well, let's see if these guys can play. Mm -hmm. and trip auditioned them and then uh and then trip had commitments to static x and he wasn't going to be able to do murder dolls and static both uh so we parted ways with him and uh i had become good friends with ac during that time and we had been in touch and he was really the only other person i knew in the industry that i had his phone number <laughs> that and, and, and I thought would fit and Joey knew him. And so we called him and then he, he came in and we started touring and uh, a lot of people don't know this, but like murder dolls, those that the, the album cover, the, the first photo shoot, all of that was done before we ever played live in a room together. Really? Ever. Now, Joey and I had played together and, and Joey and I and Trip had played as the rejects and did a show or two, you know, uh, but never with that lineup had we, you know, everything was just, you know, well, look, you, you know, like I said, we had just this certain amount of time and everything was just go, go, go. You got to do a photo shoot. Okay. Show up. You know, it wasn't even time for rehearsals yet uh so when we got together as a band for the first time to play it was about five days before that first u.s tour started and you know and i didn't know ben i didn't know eric we literally learned uh, how to be a band and and uh got to know each other on tour uh so yeah it was just a, uh, uh you know just a it was just a crazy experience for me because I literally went from the haystacks of North Carolina to, to touring around the world with, with, with this. So it was just, uh, it was an amazing time and it, and it opened up the door for what I was able to do and continue to do to, to this day. Yeah. And, and, you know, even just looking back at murder dolls, only releasing the two albums, um, does it kind of blow your mind that the band still resonates today and still sort of has the impact that it does? Yeah. You know, I, I think my, my first thought when I think about, uh, you know, fans that had the record back in the day, you know, I think, you know, when I think about, in, in today's time, I'm like, are those fans still there listening to it? And I, so when I announced I'm doing murder doll stuff, I'm thinking, well, is it going to be, you know, the old fans that, that were there in the beginning? But what I'm finding out is it, it, it is, it's those fans that were there in the beginning that we were there, you know, we came at a, a really cool time. It was just like new metal was kind of going away a bit. Right. And, you know, the emo thing was kind of kicking in, but we were just like this glam punk hybrid that just didn't really make sense. And we didn't fit in. And I think that's why we made such a, uh, uh, a you know, just a little reaction in certain parts of the world. The UK was really big for us. And uh, just, you know, having Joey uh, attached with that just instantly brought attention to it. And it was also the first time he was unmasked. So that was a big, big deal and brought a lot of attention to it. Um, but yeah, what I'm finding out though, is a lot of people are writing going, I can't go to your show. I, I love murder dolls, but I'm 13. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So it is, it is carrying on to a younger, a younger crowd. Those people that are looking at photos of that band and, and hearing the music and, and uh, hearing what we did. And it was a unique thing. Like I don't, there's no one that sounded like that. It wasn't like it was an original 
sing, I, I think it was just, we had a unique sound, you know, it was just, it was a mix of, 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 of the eighties hair metal influence. It had the punk influence. And then with Joey's metal, you know, fused into it. it had to have that aggressive edge. It was never like, it was like, Oh, if you're going to call it eighties, don't call it the wimpy eighties. We're the, we're the sleazy dark, you know, we'll stab you in the neck with a knife <laughs> side of the eighties. <laughs> You know, um, so that was very important for him because, you know, he was a well-respected drummer in the metal community and Joey didn't want, you know, when we put on lipstick, it wasn't because we were like, oh, we're trying, you know, it was just, uh, it was just a reflection of all of our influences. Like we loved, you know, I know so Joey's known for his drumming and, and the metal stuff, but a lot of people don't know that Joey, you know, uh, mo most people love Kiss. I mean, that's the, you know, people my age, you grew up on Kiss. They're just the the ones that kicked it in full gear. Kiss, Alice Cooper, Joey also loved um, uh, 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 a lot of the 80s bands that uh that were kind of like the sleazy side of like there was a lot of up and coming like 80s bands that uh you know like bands like like uh spread eagle and and vein uh, bands love them both yeah you know <laughs> they, were, they were the ones that he liked you know and and uh so we sort of incorporated those kind of sounds into the band but we wanted to make sure it, it had attitude so the lyrics had to be you know, no singing about girls unless we were throwing them in a dumpster uh, corpse <laughs> or something, you know, uh, everything had to be attitude driven. So, um, you know, but yeah, Joey loved, you know, loved Hanoi rocks, uh, you know, so it was a lot of, that's where the, the, the influence and the glam influence kind of, kind of came, came into. Now, the last time that murder dolls performed as a whole, I mean, complete, was in April of 2011. Um, why did the band split in 2013? What happened there? Uh, Slipknot. I mean, that was, Slipknot, yeah. the, you know, Slipknot was, 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 was a great thing for murder dolls. And it was also the reason why you only have two albums. Right. Uh, that, that dictated, um, that dictated uh, everything. So, you know, basically when, when the first album, uh, when we got off tour with that Slipknot was releasing their third album, they went on a two year tour. So instead of me going back to my day job, I started doing the Wednesday 13 stuff. And uh, Joey wasn't happy with that at first. He and I, he, he didn't like me doing that. He thought it was too close to murder dolls. He didn't. And, 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 uh, we just had a little feud there for a little bit. We worked it out. It was, it wasn't long, but we worked it out. Mm -hmm. But I think Joey just, you know, he was very protective of me. He didn't want me to go out. He was, I think he was afraid I was going to go out and do something and, and, and move on without him. So he wanted to kind of keep me sheltered there. So, um, but he was, you know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't happy at first when I did my first solo record, because some of those songs that I used on that album, I he, were demos that he had heard like bad things or something I'd sent to him that, uh, that I don't think he even liked, but then he heard it on the record and goes, that song's awesome. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so it was a weird thing. We had a, we had a brother, a very brotherly relationship and we'd argue and, uh, and, and over stuff, but that was a little thing that we, we worked out, um, but when it came time to do the second album, you know, it was eight years in between that two Slipknot records and three Wednesday 13 albums in between those Murder Dolls albums. And, uh, you know, when Joey got off tour, we put that band together and uh, and then we were, you know, everything was going awesome. We were doing all these great tours and, uh, you know, and then during the time of all that, uh, Paul from Slipknot had passed away. Uh, and then, uh, Slipknot wanted to go and do a tribute tour to Paul, which was, you know, was understandable. So Joey had to stop doing murder dolls and go back to Slipknot. And then when that happened, then it became a world tour again. And then we were left waiting again. So we had all this momentum going and then it would just stop momentum going. And, and, and that happened the first time, um, uh, you know, so Slipknot was always the, the, the reason that, uh, that we had to, we had to wait, wait around and do stuff. So, uh, again, instead of waiting around to do murder dolls, uh, again, for Joey, I kept doing my thing. And again, Joey got mad at me again. Uh, so, 
So it was again, it was another thing um, because we again we had it, we had the momentum going again. It felt like something was going to happen, and then uh, you know so. But again, Joey and I met uh, in 2018, and uh, we put all our differences aside. We I hung out of this house. The whole band came over, and we worked out. I even I spoke with Joey a month before he passed away. But uh, but the truth is, I mean, um, you know, Slipknot happened. He went on tour, and then uh, and then the whole thing happened with Slipknot, where uh, you know he was he was out of the band, and uh, and then Joey had. You know, I think he wanted to prove something with outside of Slipknot and not Murder Dolls. And then he started focusing on Scar the Martyr and yeah. uh, Demic Bands and and, uh, and just insane him. And so he had a lot of stuff he was trying to juggle. He wanted to do Murder Dolls again. He was talking to me in 2018, 2019 about it. Um, and I'm sure we would have done that again had uh, or would be probably working on it or have an album out if, if he was still here. Now, that being said, is there any unreleased Murder Dolls material, anything at all? Yes. There's really? one song. There's one, one song. song. Uh, I'll be honest with you. It's not the, it's not the best song to release for these times and canceled times and, and <laughs> social media <laughs> days. Right. Uh, the reason it was never released is because the label wouldn't put it out back in the day. So let me pre let me before I even tell you the title of the song, let me tell you where this title comes from. And it's not a song that was wrote from any point of view from the band. It was literally a title. So in 1996, my band Frankenstein Drag Queens released our first album. Some of those songs on that first album ended up being on Murder Dolls first first album. There's a track on the album called Hit and Rape. Okay. I got this title from the from the back of a magazine called Cult Magazines. It was a black and white magazine I used to it's like bi monthly or whatever. And in the back of this magazine, it just had a list of VHSs that you could order from like Japan and all these other countries and you know, you just just the title alone, you know, no picture or anything, just small print. And, and there was a title for a movie that said Hit and Rape and the description said Cops in Tokyo go around blasting the heads off rapist. And I was like, that's, that's a cool title. So I wrote a song about it. Joey liked that song. That was one of the songs that he picked and we recorded it. It was going to be on the thing. And then when the label saw the track, the track listing and saw hit and rape, they were like, no way you can't put a song out with the word rape in it. And so we didn't. So I, I, and I, believe i'm the only person that has a copy of the song do you think it'll ever see the light of day at any point if i put it out yeah okay if i was more computer savvy it would probably already be out um okay. i just don't but no i i actually i have it i i was going through some of the music just you know we're rehearsing for the for the the tour and i'm just refreshing the songs and i was going back and i actually had it put into the track list in a beyond the Valley where it was originally going to be. Uh, and we, we played it live a couple of times on that, uh, on the first tour. And, uh, but yeah, the label was, was totally against it. And, and, uh, and that's the, that, that's the track that was fully recorded, mixed, mastered and done. And, and is sitting on my iTunes library right now. When I'd love to hear that track. It's man. great. It sounds just <laughs> like a record. It's got a, I mean, it even starts off with Joey counting on the hi hat one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, rape. Not uh, not advocating or promoting that. It, it was about <laughs> it was about killing rapists. AC and Eric, I know that they were doing some stuff for under the Murder Dolls name, trying to sort of get that thing going last year. Um, and you had you had responded to that in social media. Has there been any progression there? Have you spoken with AC and Eric at all since then? You know, I've I made a decision this year to just not even to discuss any of that because I don't think it's really fair to the legacy of the band or the fans to hear anybody from that band arguing or disagreeing or anything. It needs to be about the band needs to be about the music. And that's kind of where I've, I've left it. Um, but get, let's get talk about you a little bit, man. I mean, how do you find touring sober? Is that a whole different experience for you? Yes. I can imagine. Uh, it's a much better experience. Um, really? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, 
I participated in the rock and roll lifestyle uh, for quite some time. I was never a drug guy ever, ever. I've, I've never ever done any hard drugs. Uh, uh, I smoke weed. I still smoke weed. That's why the, the sober word kind of, I don't throw the word, Oh, I'm sober, sober this. Cause I feel I'm, that's not being sober smoking weed. I get that, right. but I don't drink booze anymore. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, for me being on tour and not doing that, that's just a, a, a much better, uh, it's a be- much better for me all around. I, I sing better. I play better. I feel better. I, I act better. I look better. Uh, and you know, it's just got to a, to a, to an age where I just, I didn't need it anymore. I realized I'm, I'm better off without it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to, to get on tour and, and, uh, continue that. Uh, some of your other projects as well. Is bourbon crow still in existence? Is that still a thing? Yeah. I mean, it's always, it's always in a, in a there, uh, yeah. you know, okay. that was always just a project that was a recording project. And if it ever did anything live, cool. If it didn't cool. Uh, so it's still there. It's still cool to do. Um, right. it's just, you know, for me, uh, I just don't have the time to do it. Um, you know, the band or the idea was, was, was between me and my friend Rand who, slits vocal duties and songwriting duties in that band. And, uh, he and I, uh, live really close together when I lived in North Carolina and now I live in Los Angeles. So we're not really, uh, in the same space uh, all the time. You know, he does visit a lot and we do keep in touch, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, you know, I've just been so just coming out of the COVID thing and trying to get the momentum going with, with Wednesday 13 and get things flowing again, where it feels normal again, has been, has been uh, a struggle, you know, I think for, for us and for a lot of bands, just getting it back to normal again. And so to have any other things going on uh, besides Wednesday 13, I just don't have the time or energy for it. Completely understand that, man. I mean, like Horrifier was the last album I got from you that came out last year. Uh, is there something new in the works with Wednesday 13? Um, I mean, there will be the the 10th album from Wednesday 13. It's not going to be out in 2024. Uh, I'd see that 2025. I imagine we're going to have to write and record it sometime in 2024. I don't really know when. I'm still kind of getting our touring schedule figured out and then see what months are off. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, we're always writing. I have my handful of songs and song ideas and, uh, you know, uh, there's never, ever, ever been hard for us to come up with material. And, uh, so I'm, I'm excited to see where, where, uh, where we take it on the next one. You know, it's all, it's always exciting. I don't really, I, I know that I've been doing all of this, uh, you know, getting geared up and getting my mindset and playing these old murdered all songs. It's definitely brought up that style of music again. So I think that'll be a big influence on the songwriting of, of the next Wednesday 13. And I love, I love the, the content that you write about Wednesday 13 and the way you perform it, uh, the whole, the, all the imagery that goes along with it. Cause I'm such a big horror guy myself, much like you are. Um, mm-hmm. But wh- how, where do you specifically draw your content from for you? Like when you're creating a song, what's your process Wednesday? Well, this is just one room I have that has a lot of my favorite stuff and collectibles and movies and toys. And uh, so literally, if uh, you know, I've got a guitar here beside of me and a TV here and I'm just uh, I look around, you know, and go, you know, what have I not? wrote about yet or what you know just it could be anything and i've stared at i mean some of these toys are you know 30 years old you know and and uh and i've looked at them a half a dozen times and then one day i'll look at them and go there's an idea so i just try to surround myself with with what influenced me uh uh and it's and it's beyond music you know music was is one influence on it but the the horror horror movies uh horror imagery um just all the stuff that i grew up on in the 80s you know the super friends uh 
you know, all of, all of that is a, is what has made me, uh, who I am. And, and, you know, all those ingredients, it's not just, a uh, a musical thing. You know, I see you got the trick or treat shirt on, man. That's one of my favorite yeah. movies to watch around Halloween. I love that. Um, yeah. I gotta, I gotta ask you, this is something I've always wanted to ask you when it's the time of year. I think it's perfect as well. What would you say are three essential horror movies that you like to watch during the Halloween season? They don't have to be about Halloween per se, but what are three horror movies you like to watch around the Halloween season or would you suggest to people? Uh, it's pretty simple. I hate to be, you know, generic uh, or, but it's uh Halloween one, two and three are the essential Halloween movies. Uh, no, the way it's really. In. Yeah. I mean, the, they're, they're great. I literally just watched part three again for probably the third time this month, this morning. It's so good. <laughs> uh, and I was at a Halloween convention, uh, the 45 years of the Halloween franchise just last weekend. And, uh, and I actually met some of the actors. I met, uh, Tom Atkins from that movie and oh, I love him. Yeah. And I got a Halloween three limited edition figure autographed by him, uh, which is in one of these cases behind me. And, uh, but no, ha Halloween, the Michael Myers, ever since I was a kid, the, that particular character terrified me, uh, as a kid, like I just, I lost sleep over it. Just, uh, his imagery. It was before you could buy the mask and the stores and all that stuff. So it was just extra scary because you didn't know anything about him. And, uh, you know, I used to go trick or treating and then I would come home and Halloween two, the end would always be on. I'd see the end of, even of that seeing when he gets shot in the eyes and catches on fire. And then Halloween three would come on right after that. Yeah. And I never put it together why Michael Myers was not in it. I just, it was just, it was a, another creepy, weird movie. And uh, it's definitely stayed with me over the years. And those are my, my three favorites. Now you can throw any type of movie into Halloween. Halloween is whatever anybody wants it to be. But for me, those movies are based on Halloween night and leading up to Halloween. So those are the, those are the three that, and even though Michael Myers is not in the third one, it doesn't matter. It's still a weird, creepy, cool movie. That's, I mean, any movie that, 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 that the plot line is to murder all the kids on <laughs> Halloween by putting a Halloween mask on us. That's great. Silver Shamrock. <laughs> yep. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today, man. It's uh, it's been a long time coming. I've been waiting for this interview for quite a few years, man. So yeah. uh, I'm so happy it finally happened, man. <laughs> cool. Awesome, man. Thank you for your time. Loaded Radio.